two. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Karen McLennan. I'm a doctor of audiology and it's a pleasure to join you this evening to talk about ears, hearing, and hearing loss. And I have to thank the Port Jeff Public Library for supporting this session. Um, the Port Jeff Library has been doing some great programming this summer and so I just wanted to be a part of that programming and I hope anybody that views this uh, recording uh, enjoys. Okay, so we're going to get started. Okay, so... recording. Okay, so we're going to get started. And here we go. So my name is Karen McLennan. I'm a doctor of audiology and a teacher of the speech and hearing handicap. I'm also a, an assistant adjunct professor at Long Island University post campus. And I began my professional career as an audiologist at Helen Keller National Center over 20 years ago. And since then, I've held a variety of positions. I've worked in hospitals and uh, other locations. And currently, I am a consultant for a preschool and early intervention center in Nassau County. But I also own a private practice, Northeast Hearing, where uh, we install assistive listening devices in public facilities. So today's outline, we're gonna cover a little bit of the anatomy of the ear. We're gonna talk a little bit about hearing and a little bit about hearing loss and how hearing loss is treated. A Couple of facts on hearing loss in the United States. 48 million Americans live with hearing loss, and over 12,000 babies are born with hearing loss every year. And 18 million Americans with hearing loss are under the age of 65. And this is an interesting fact because a lot of times, some folks assume that hearing loss is an older person's healthcare issue, but hearing loss doesn't discriminate. It affects individuals of all ages. And one to six per 1,000 babies are born with a congenital hearing loss. And if you suspect a hearing loss, I do recommend getting a hearing test. And we're gonna talk about hearing tests in the course of this session this evening. Because on average, individuals, it takes them about seven years before uh, at the time when they suspect a hearing loss, and then it takes about seven years before they're actually ready to do something about it. And seven years is a long time to live with a hearing loss. So if you do suspect hearing loss, I do recommend, highly recommend getting your hearing tested by an audiologist. So hearing loss, there are three types of hearing loss, conductive, sensory neural and mixed hearing losses. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about these three specifically. And what I'm gonna do is share another image with you of the anatomy of the ear. And here's a great picture of the anatomy of the ear. So right now we can see the outer ear and that is, um, includes the pinna all the way up to the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And then we have the middle ear. And when I click on the middle ear button here, the middle ear is gonna be highlighted. The middle ear is made up of the eardrum or tympanic membrane, the three middle ear bones, and the last bone, the stapes, is actually sitting in the foot plate of the inner ear. Another interesting aspect anatomically of the middle ear is this long tube that extends from the base of the middle ear space to the back of the throat, and that's the eustachian tube. And lastly, the inner ear is this area in white. This snail-shaped organ is the cochlea, 
the, or the sense organ for hearing, the inner ear is also made up of the balance organs, and that would be the sense, uh, the semicircular canals. And once uh, stimulated, once the in inner ear is stimulated, electrochemical signals leave the inner ear and travel up this yellow area, which is the eighth nerve, and that's the, our nerve for hearing. And so I'm just going to quickly show you what it looks like when um, physiologically what's happening when we hear sound. So I'm going to talk over this little bit of music and explain what's happening here. But air particles are traveling in through the inner ear. They're pinging or hitting up against the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. The three middle ear bones are moving in response to that vibration. And the last bone, the scapes, pushes on the inner ear and stimulates the hair cells in the inner ear. And that triggers an electrochemical release. And those electrochemical signals travel up the eighth nerve to the brain. So that is the anatomy uh, and physiology of the ear. And I will stop sharing this screen and continue sharing the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so, so this is where we left off. The hearing loss slide, conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, and mixed hearing losses. So when we looked at the outer ear and the middle ear, when hearing loss happens in that area, it's referred to as a conductive hearing loss. When hearing loss occurs in the inner ear, it's referred to as a sensory neural hearing loss. And when you have hearing loss that's made up of a little bit of a conductive issue and an issue with the inner ear, it's considered a mixed hearing loss. This is a visual analogy that I like to share about hearing loss. And perfect hearing or near normal hearing is this clear. Hearing loss, on the other hand, can significantly impact the clarity or the quality of our hearing. So that's important to remember. At this point, I would like to share an audio demonstration and this is a simulation of high frequency hearing loss. Now this, a high frequency hearing loss is very, um, very common uh, and it's associated with age related hearing loss or presbycusis. So I'm only gonna play one or two of these audio demonstrations, but the audio demonstration, the word that you'll hear and it's a one syllable word, um, it has been filtered so that you're not hearing the high frequency sounds of that word. So let's give the first simulation a listen. Word number one, who? So you probably heard ooh, and that's not surprising because ooh is a lower frequency sound and age-related hearing loss or presbycusic hearing loss tends to affect the higher frequencies. So those higher frequencies were filtered out of that word, but the word was shoe, S-H-O-E. And so let's just do one more. Oops. Word number two, who? Oh. And again, you probably heard vowels really well. Vowels are low frequency sounds. We often hear them very well. Um, they're also louder sounds, uh, too, louder to our ears. Uh, but that word was tree, T-R-E-E. -E. Okay, so we're gonna continue moving forward. So when we get our hearing tested, an audiologist will test the auditory pathway. And the most common way for hearing tests to take place would be with headphones on. 
And when we test with headphones, we are testing the entire auditory pathway. So we're testing the outer ear, the middle ear, the inner ear, sound travels or electrochemical signals travel up the eighth nerve and eventually we hear the sound at the level of the brain. And so when we test hearing, this entire auditory pathway is being assessed. And when an audiologist tests your hearing, they're most often, often going to document your hearing test results on an audiogram. And there's two parts of the audiogram that I wanna review today. And that's this graph here, uh, specifically the audiogram. And we use symbols, circles and X's and carrots, sometimes triangles and squares. And when they're placed on this graph, it tells us uh, about the quantity of your hearing or quantity of your hearing loss. And that's really important to know, how much hearing or how much hearing loss is present. But another portion of a hearing test includes some speech audiometry testing. And specifically, um, one of the highlights that I just want to review today is the word recognition test these are, uh, this is a test where you're asked to listen to one syllable words and uh, the result is given in a percentage score. That doesn't mean how much percentage hearing loss you have, it's just uh, the percentage of words that you identified correctly. So that's really important because we do want to know about the quantity of your hearing, how much hearing or hearing loss is present, but we also want to use speech audiometry testing to tell us about the quality of your hearing. Is he your hearing loss affecting the clarity of your hearing? So that's really important. If I may just add one comment, uh, speech audiometry testing should be done two ways. First, we like to perform speech audiometry testing in quiet, but it's really important that an audiologist assess your hearing, your speech, your word, your ability to understand one syllable words in the presence of background noise, because that information is incredibly important in helping an audiologist determine how well hearing instruments are going to work, for your hearing loss, how well they're gonna work for you, and what accessories may be needed to improve access to speech. So some symbols on the audiogram that you may see include X's and circles. Uh, circles represent the right ear, sometimes they're shown in red. X's represent the left ear, uh, and sometimes they're in either blue or black ink. And so when, when an audiologist tests your hearing, they're looking for the softest sounds that you can hear. So they're gonna plot circles and X's and some other symbols on this audiogram. And ultimately, what we like to ascertain when those symbols are plotted on the audiogram is um, how much determining how much of a degree of hearing loss is present. And so if your circles and X's or the softest sounds that you can hear, also known as thresholds, so if the, if the circles and X's, the softest sounds that you can hear fall between negative 10 and 15 decibels, your hearing is considered within normal limits. If your thresholds, the softest sounds that you can hear, fall within 16 to 25 decibels, it's considered a slight hearing loss. And when the symbols fall between 26 and 40 decibels, the hearing loss is considered mild. And between 41 and 55, we have a moderate hearing loss. Moderately severe hearing loss, those circles and X's will fall between 55 and 70 dB. And a severe hearing loss, 
your, the softest sounds that you can hear fall between 71 and 85 decibels. And if you're, if the softest sounds that you can hear are 85 decibels or greater, it's considered a profound hearing loss. And so here I'm going to slightly move the various degrees of hearing loss over to the side of the slide so we can look at how some symbols are plotted on the audiogram. And so in this example, I've included X's which represent the softest sounds that this person can hear in their left ear. And if we look at the um, abscissor, across the top, 250, 500, 1,000, all the way up to 8,000, those are the frequencies that we test. So uh, this person, the softest sounds that they can hear at the frequencies that we test during an audiological evaluation fall within the mild hearing loss range. And in this example, we can see that the softest sounds that this person hears in their left ear uh, is at 80 decibels across the frequency range, and that is falling in the severe hearing loss range. And when I talk about hearing loss, these degrees are really important. Um, but in terms of understanding how it affects our ability to hear speech, um, I think we can use these varying descriptors, slight, mild, moderate, moderately severe, um, to convey how much difficulty a person may have uh, communicating with other people. So I'm going to back up here and go back to uh, left ear hearing results plotted at 30 decibels. And using the word mild, I would say to a person who has this hearing loss, a mild hearing loss, that a mild hearing loss is going to mildly affect your ability to communicate with others. And when your hearing loss falls around 80 decibels, that much hearing loss is going to have a severe effect on your ability to communicate with others. And so um, if, if communicating, if, you're, if you've grown up communicating as a hearing and a person that uses speech to communicate, you certainly want to treat this much hearing loss because hearing loss um, does have multiple negative consequences on quality of life, uh, in some cases on our ability to um, remain gainfully employed. And so whenever a hearing loss is present, it's really important to treat that hearing loss so that the negative consequences of hearing loss can be reduced. And lastly, uh, these are right ear results falling in the severe hearing loss range. And we have this right ear hearing test results are showing a mild sloping to moderately severe hearing loss. Okay, so when hearing, is, hearing loss is present and you have a minimal or a slight hearing loss, it is difficult to distinguish soft sounds or distant sounds of speech. And when mild losses are present, individuals can miss as much as 25 to 40% of speech. And if a moderate hearing loss is present, that can affect our ability to hear 50 to 75% of the information. Uh, in this instance, this slide was taken from an educational presentation that I gave. Um, so it's, relevant to students in the classroom, but it's also relevant to people that are outside of the classroom, not in the educational system. A moderate hearing loss um, will result in missing a lot of, of the, a lot of sounds of speech. And so if a moderately severe hearing loss is present, 100% of the information shared in a classroom could be missed. So just to be clear, uh, in reviewing those speech audiometry test results, um, 
yes, it's important to understand how much hearing loss is present, but those word recognition scores, again, are incredibly important because they do tell us about the quality of our hearing. Because as we, as we get older, um, hearing loss, certainly the audibility or, or our ability to hear soft sounds change, but in many cases, the quality of our hearing can deteriorate also. So it's really important to get that information and um, understanding how well we hear in the presence of background noise is again, an incredibly important aspect of the audiological evaluation. And so moving along, I did wanna talk about um, hearing devices and I'll talk a little bit about accessories as well because hearing devices are very helpful, but in some instances, individuals also need accessories to improve their ability to hear in difficult situations. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So when a hearing loss is present, uh, hearing instruments are certainly an option. In this image, there are some behind the ear hearing instruments that are shown when hearing it, when you're, you, the hearing loss is, is so significant that hearing aids or hearing instruments are of little benefit, cochlear implants are an option for some individuals. The benefits of using hearing instruments and cochlear implants, there are many benefits. They increase audibility of all sounds, they improve our ability to hear in quiet environments. Hearing devices improve our ability to communicate in one-on-one -on -one situations and in small groups. And overall, there is an improvement in quality of life. I fit a number of individuals with hearing instruments over the course of 20 years as an audiologist. And it's amazing to see how, um, how many sounds people can hear after they've elected to wear hearing instruments. I know um, one person that I fit with hearing instruments reported back to me that uh, they had no idea how much their, um, their dog's nails needed to be clipped because over the course of seven to 10 years, her hearing gradually deteriorated and she just wasn't hearing um, her dog as her dog walked across the hardwood floor. But once she elected to wear hearing aids, her ability to hear those soft sounds improved. And she was actually a little bit annoyed at her family. She said, I wish somebody would have told me that we had to clip the dog's toenails. And another gentleman that I fit with hearing instruments was so overly impressed with hearing birds sing in his backyard. He hadn't realized that he lost the ability to hear those sounds and it was a very pleasant surprise for him to hear his, the birds in his backyard singing. So uh, the increased audibility is incredibly important. Um, the improvement in our ability to communicate with others and in small groups uh, certainly helps with our um, improve our quality of life. And so hearing instruments are really important and they do do great things, but they are, um, there are some limitations to wearing hearing aids. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try hearing aids, you should, but if you have difficulty hearing in the presence of background noise, as determined by the hearing test results, um, the hearing instruments probably aren't going to help you in those noisy background situations. So in those situations, you might need to uh, use some accessories. So hearing instruments for some people do not work well in difficult listening environments where background noise is present. Um, individuals with hearing loss, they need um, an improvement in the signal to noise ratio. And that just means that the voice they want to hear has to be about 15 to 25 decibels above the presence of the background noise in the room. People that don't have hearing loss can hear well with less 
um, signal to noise ratio uh, difference. So people without hearing loss hear well with as little as a 6 dB signal to noise ratio, but people with hearing loss, um, uh, studies have shown that a greater signal to noise ratio is needed. And on average, our hearing instruments are roughly able to provide a plus 5 dB improvement in signal to noise ratio. And why this is important and why we have to, when you participate in a hearing test, why you need to make sure the audiologist you're working with is testing your ability to hear in the presence of background noise, because if you are struggling to hear in the presence of background noise, accessories are needed in addition to hearing instruments for those difficult listening situations. So just to talk a little bit more about hearing instruments, we have um, four hearing devices here. They're behind the ear models. Um, they run on a battery, you know, in probably the last five or so years, um, you can have disposable batteries or more recently, um, rechargeable batteries. Those have come on the market uh, probably more so in the last five years, but they're very, very common now. And so uh, volume buttons are sometimes provided on the hearing instrument itself, um, but if there isn't a volume button on the device, you can use a remote control to control the volume. And there are program buttons on some hearing instruments, but again, your programs uh, and some hearing aids can have as many as three to five to six programs. Um, but, but you can access those programs with a button or with a remote control. And cochlear implants, as I mentioned earlier, these are for um, more severe hearing losses. These are prosthetic electronic devices that, are, um, that have two components, an internal component and an external component. And so a cochlear implant is surgically implanted uh, into the ear, and then an external component is worn behind the ear, as shown with this little boy. Um, what you see are the external components of his cochlear implants. The internal components, as I mentioned, they're surgically implanted and not visible um, after the surgery. So those accessories that I'd like everybody to keep an open mind about, um, there are some components of hearing instruments. Um, and although technically not an accessory, a T-coil is a component of a hearing instrument. Uh, T-coils are in hearing aids and cochlear implants. I highly recommend hearing devices with telecoils because telecoils are, are a little technology inside the cochlear implant and the hearing aid that allow you to access um, assistive listening devices that are present in public facilities. So T-coils are incredibly important. Bluetooth technology is incredibly important because you can stream a telephone phone call to hearing aids. You can stream um, TV audio directly into your hearing aids with Bluetooth. And so Bluetooth is an accessory um, or Bluetooth has accessories that you can utilize with your hearing instruments. Remote microphones are fabulous. Um, in situations where, uh, let's say if you're in a classroom and you're not able to sit toward the front of the room where the teacher is standing, you can place a remote microphone at the teacher's desk or the podium That'll pick up the teacher's voice very easily because it's in close proximity to the teacher and transmit that voice or their voice to your hearing instruments and you can hear it, the teacher's voice, as if they're sitting right next to you. So remote microphones are incredibly helpful, um, especially for people that have difficulty hearing in the presence of background noise. And those TV transmitters are other accessories. They generally work via Bluetooth, but they're very, very helpful 
I know um, I have a family member that uses a TV transmitter and it's, um, it's been really nice for the family because prior to um, using a TV transmitter and prior to using hearing instruments, the TV volume was very, very loud. And so once my family member decided to treat the hearing loss and was open, open to using various accessories like a TV transmitter, the whole family could sit down together and watch a television show. So that has really improved uh, the quality of life, not only for my family member, but for the rest of the family who, you know, really enjoys spending time together. Other things to keep in mind when we consider hearing and hearing loss are some communication strategies. Communication strategies are little things that we can do to improve our ability to um, hear a message and avoid a communication breakdown. And so um, I mentioned that there is hearing loss in my family and um, there's a great quote by Mark Ross um, he's an audiologist and he, his quote was, if one person in the family has a hearing loss, the whole family has a hearing problem. And I think that is especially fitting uh, because hearing loss does affect the individual with hearing loss, but it also affects the people that they share a home with. Um, their significant other, their spouses, their children, because communication breakdowns can occur when hearing loss is present. And so some of the things that we can do to improve our ability to communicate effectively is obtaining somebody's attention prior to speaking. So with my family, I try to, um, you know, be in the same room with them when we're having a conversation, or I'll say, Oh, and use their name, and and then they they're really aware that I'm I'm intending to communicate with them. So getting somebody's attention prior to speaking is very helpful. Face to face communication is incredibly helpful because you can pick up additional visual cues and supplement what you're hearing, and you can ask others to sit closer to you if you're struggling to hear. For some people with hearing loss, um, even after they've elected to wear hearing devices, their ability to hear over long distances may not improve. So reducing the space between you and somebody you're communicating with will help tremendously. I always recommend speaking slowly, speaking clearly, and for family members, speaking one at a time. When I work with children that have hearing loss, if we're reviewing some information, I try to provide directions very simply, and, and then I check back for understanding, just because I wanna make sure that they're, they're getting the message. Um, especially with kids that have hearing loss and oftentimes with adults too, they, they may not want to admit that they haven't heard. So uh, checking for understanding, providing simple directions is very helpful. Reducing background noise when you're having a conversation with somebody that has hearing loss is very helpful. Um, it improves the signal to noise ratio and uh, avoid sitting or avoid having a conversation when you're sitting near an air conditioner or you're sitting near a window and somebody's um, cutting the hedges outside of the window or mowing the lawn. Because competing noise is, is detrimental for many people with hearing loss. And if you have hearing loss, sometimes I suggest rephrasing. Sometimes people choose to repeat, but I like the idea of rephrasing because it changes up the message. And if somebody heard a little bit of the message the first time, but didn't get the whole message, if I rephrase what I said, um, they may stand a better chance of understanding the utterance. And other communication and teaching strategies, especially if you're in a school situation, but uh, you know anywhere where you want to hear well, 
being seated close to the point of instruction or the sound source is will help you and um, make listening a little bit easier as long as there's uh, no background noise present. Um, if we're face to face communication again is very important. Uh, speaking slowly and clearly, as I said earlier, and I added a special note here, increasing volume reduces intelligibility. And that's a really interesting fact about hearing loss. A lot, there's a misconception that if somebody has hearing loss, all I have to do is shout louder and then they'll hear me. But hearing loss doesn't work that way. If you're not heard well, increasing volume distorts intelligibility, it distorts your speech, it distorts your facial features, and it doesn't improve uh, a person's ability to understand a message. So the best thing we can do is reduce background noise, get closer to the person that we're speaking to, uh, because increasing volume doesn't improve our ability to hear necessarily. Simplify instructions and check for understanding. Um, always use face-to-face -face communication. And if I may make one suggestion, I think it's really important uh, for people that have hearing loss to join support groups. In New York, we have um, a number of support groups, but our most local support groups, local to the Port Jeff Free Library, is the Hearing Loss Association of America. There's a chapter in New York City, there is a chapter on Long Island in Nassau County, and the good news is, is that you don't physically have to go to these meetings. They are all online and virtual. So they share a lot of amazing information. I'm a member of the Hearing Loss Association of America. It is um, very inexpensive to join. And I think people that join get a really big bang for their buck in terms of support, education, um, access to resources, camaraderie, friendship, um, I know a lot of people in both chapters and, and they're pretty, pretty awesome people. And they have a lot of events throughout the course of the year. Currently, a lot of events are going virtual, um, but it is um, a strong recommendation uh, for support purposes, uh, if you have hearing loss, to join the Hearing Loss Association of America. Okay, so at this time, I would like to take some questions, if anybody has questions. And I will open up the chat feature and see if there are any questions coming along. Okay, at this point, I do not see any questions. Oh, it looks like somebody's typing. Ah, the question is, how important is it to get my hearing tested every year? So that's a great question. Thanks for ask, asking the question. It's really important to have our hearing tested every year especially if hearing loss is present. Uh, one, you want to understand how much hearing loss is present, how much difficulty um, you're having with quantity, how much hearing loss you have, and if the hearing loss is affecting the quality of your hearing. So I recommend uh, hearing tests every year, sooner if you suspect a problem. And there's another great question. What signs should people look out for that indicate a hearing loss is present? That's a really good question. So interestingly enough, if somebody has hearing loss, they probably won't be the first person that suspects a hearing loss. Oftentimes, family members notice somebody else's hearing difficulties first. 
uh, because hearing loss, especially age-related or presbycusis, age-related hearing loss or presbycusis, it happens very slowly, very gradually. We're not always aware of the very gradual changes in our ability to hear. A family member may be more in tune with those slight and slow changes. So um, I recommend having a conversation with your family. Um, if you think your hearing is fine, why not ask somebody else what their opinion is? And if you don't wanna do that, go for a hearing test. That will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, but what other signs should people look out for that indicate a hearing loss? Um, a lot of times people will lean in when they don't hear or they have hearing loss or not hearing well. Sometimes they'll cup their ear. Um, a lot of times I see people say, huh, or what a lot. So those are some of the indicators that there may be an issue. Ah, and we have one more question. Um, is it possible to reprogram the hearing aid for, for a deceased family member? The answer to that question is yes. There may be an option to reprogram a hearing device for another person. Um, I don't provide that service. Um, I have a private practice, but I work with public facilities. But I know private practices where a hearing device will be assessed in terms of um, how well it's working and then reprogrammed if necessary to fit another hearing loss. It sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't work. It, it really depends on the device because some devices have a limited range in terms of how much amplification they provide. But that is a service that you will have to pay for but um, I have seen um, that service provided in private practice, yes. And another question, how, is it, how easy is it to get your hearing tested and where should people go? Well, I'm a big fan of um, utilizing healthcare insurance. So if you have health insurance, I recommend um, you can find an audiologist that's in your plan. You can find an audiologist sometimes in an ear, nose, and throat practice, and they can get your hearing tested. Uh, you can make an appointment with the ear, nose, and throat physician, mention that you have hearing loss, and they'll set you up with the audiologist that's in the practice. Um, but I do recommend a licensed hearing healthcare professional, uh, a licensed audiologist, which um, in New York State, if you're practicing audiology, you have to have a New York State license to do so. Okay, if there are any other questions, you can post them now. Otherwise, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And it's been my pleasure, and I want to thank the Port Jeff Free Library for supporting this talk today. And uh, I wish you all the best. Stay well, stay healthy this summer and moving forward. And remember, if you suspect hearing loss, please get your hearing tested. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a great night.